All right, friends, welcome back. Welcome back, Kids Week 2022 at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Hello, once again, everyone, we are broadcasting live. And also, I'm so excited to have a really special speaker with us today now. As promised, we have someone here from NASA. NASA is currently, as you know, exploring Mars. We are looking for signs of past life. And we've got this amazing thing right here, the Perseverance rover. We've got a full-scale model of it right upstairs above your head in the Space Shuttle Pavilion. But I'm so thrilled to introduce to the stage today, we've got Elio Morillo, Engineering Operations Mechanism Lead for the Perseverance rover from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he is here to talk a little bit about his work on Mars with the amazing rover. Are you guys ready? Are you excited? All right, so welcome to the stage, Elio. And he's also gonna be able to answer some questions from you all afterwards too. So stick around and I'll pass it on over to you, thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can you guys hear me well? A little bit, maybe, yeah, a little feedback, Is that good? Welcome, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm traveling from California, just joined this weekend to come out to the USS Intrepid. I've been telling people, I used to come here as a high school student, and this is a full circle moment for me to now be here sharing what we do with Perseverance on Mars. Uh, so this is very special. But before we get into everything that Perseverance does, I wanna talk about Mars, talk about some facts about the planet. Obviously, very red. I'm not gonna ask you what it looks like. We have plenty of pictures. It's red, orange. It's pretty cold, okay? It's a very cold planet. You guys think because it's red or orange, it may be hot, but no, it's actually a very cold planet. Where we are with Perseverance, the temperature ranges between 100 and negative 25 Fahrenheit to 23 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty cold, even on the warmest day. On top of that, the atmosphere on Mars is very thin, very, very thin, so there's less air than there is on Earth. So if you and I were to stand on the surface of Mars, our lungs that are so tuned for this atmosphere, we wouldn't even be able to attempt to breathe. So keep that in mind. And there's also very little air that we have to learn how to use, especially when we try and fly helicopters, which we'll get to a little bit after a few slides. One cool thing about Mars is that the gravity is less than the gravity we have on Earth. It's about a third. So what does that mean? you guys can jump a little higher if you're ever on the surface of Mars, right? A lot higher, maybe, who knows? Maybe if you're just strong enough, you could jump really high. Mars also takes about 687 Earth days to lap the sun, right? So here, it takes us about 365 days to take one lap around the sun, but Mars takes that much. Also keep in mind, Mars is really far away from Earth. Okay, so depending where Mars is compared to Earth, it can take anywhere between 6 to 20 minutes for a signal to travel from here to Mars and vice versa. So at once we're controlling all of our robots, don't think we have a remote control or a joystick that we just tell it to move forward. We have to really think about what we tell the rover to do because it does it completely autonomously. But I'll get to that later. Another really fun fact about Mars is that it takes, for a single day, it takes about 24 hours and 40 minutes. So it's very close to a day on Earth, but that's why we call Martian days souls, to keep a distinction of the time zone on Mars versus the time here on Earth. And I'll get to what that means as we started operating the vehicle, because I, did, I do get to say that I lived on Mars time zone for some time. You know, some people say they have to wake up and talk with people in the Pacific, mountain time. Some people have to talk and have calls in China. Well, I had to wake up and have calls with Mars. Before we get to Perseverance, I wanted to show you guys this image. Before we landed last year on Mars with Perseverance, which by the way, we've been there for about a year now, a little bit more than a year. We have a whole history of orbiters, landers and previous rovers that have been there since some of us bef before we were even born. And with all of those rovers and all of those landers and orbiters, we've been learning so much about the planet, particularly what is it made of? What's there, right? What type of rocks? Was there ever water? Yes, there was, right? If you look at pictures of Mars, it's almost obvious. 
right? You look at the pictures, and I'll show you later where we are with Perseverance. It's very clear that water flowed through there. It looks very much like the Mississippi Delta here in the United States. We had liquid oceans, liquid lakes. We had liquid water. Now, the next big thing that we're trying to understand, right, after figuring that out is whether or not life was able to be supported on Mars. And we did that with Curiosity, the previous rover that before we got there with Perseverance, we confirmed that there was a habitable environment. At some point in the history of Mars, there could have been an environment that supported microbial life. So that's where Perseverance now steps in. We're trying to understand whether or not there was life at some point in the billions of years of Martian history. Looking towards the future as well, though, there's other missions that are being planned. Right now on Mars, there's three operating vehicles, two of which are from the United States, Curiosity and Perseverance, and the Chinese rover that just landed a few months ago as well. In the future, there may be more, and that's also maybe when we may have humans. So maybe some of the people here in the audience will be those astronauts that get to Mars. Talking a little bit about Perseverance specifically, what are we trying to do with the Perseverance rover? There are specific objectives that we're trying to accomplish while we're there during its first three years or during its primary mission of three Earth years. Number one, continue understanding that habitability aspect, studying the rocks. What type of rocks do we see? If there was water, what do the, what do the rocks look like? And if you go to our exhibit, or if you've already have, we have some samples of Earth rocks that we think we may find rocks similar to that on Mars. Along with that, we're trying to find biosignatures. So if there was life there, we're trying to look for traces, ge ge looking at geometry, just looking at shapes of the kind of molecules and elements that may be present in these rocks. One of the big aspects of doing those kind of studies is that our rover is also trying to collect samples, and it has successfully collected six so far, samples that we will eventually return to Earth so that then we can study them more conclusively and really figure out what are we observing on the surface of Mars. Another aspect that's really important to the mission is to prepare for humans, right? At some point, we want to go there. And I know some of you have come up to us and told us that you want to be those astronauts, and maybe you will be. So if we want to go to Mars, we need to know how we can survive there. One of the key demonstrations of technology we've accomplished with the Perseverance rover is that we've, able, we've been able to produce oxygen on the surface of Mars, utilizing the carbon dioxide that we find as the primary component on the Martian atmosphere, which is something we're going to have to do. And we've been able to do it with perseverance in very, very minute amounts. But it's a technology that maybe in the future we would be able to scale so that the humans that go there can survive and breathe in those habitable environments they'll have to bring along. Perseverance and Ingenuity have been very busy over the last year. We landed. It was amazing. I was able to be right there on the lab and celebrate with my teammates when we accomplished this amazing feat. There's great videos, and I'll show you a snippet of it later, but tell your parents to show you later on YouTube because there's been nothing like it before. It was the first time we recorded that video. We tested so many of our subsystems, making sure everything worked, that in the long travel to Mars, nothing broke down, and that we were able to actually accomplish all of the objectives with our mechanisms. We took our first flight, and I'll get into the details of those with Ingenuity, the first time ever that we've flown a helicopter outside of Earth, which is a big accomplishment for us as a society. And then, of course, we're continuing to explore rocks, taking samples, and I'll show you guys some pictures of what those look like, so these samples that we want to bring back so we can study here on the surface of, Mars, of, of Earth. This video, we basically attached some sports cameras that recorded the sky crane maneuver, what we used to land on the surface of Mars, something we had never been able to do, but we actually saw it almost like as if we were there, right? It was very different, and I'll tell you as an engineer that was on console that day, when we landed on Mars, we saw the numbers, we saw the messages, we saw the data. But a few days later, when we got the full video, it felt like we were reliving that exact moment. It had been something we had never done, and it was incredible having our eyes on the surface of Mars with this perspective. So far, we've been navigating on the surface of Mars over the last year for about 4.4 kilometers, or about, about three miles or so on the surface of Mars, where we've covered 
the landing site area, the Octavia Butler landing site, and it's nearby areas collecting samples that scientists have determined have been interesting enough. And along with that, we've been able to fly our helicopter and have a scout that helps us recognize, especially areas where the rover can't necessarily traverse. There's a big chunk of this, which is very sandy, and you don't want to drive a rover over sand because we may get stuck. So instead, we have a helicopter that helps us fly and see those images and recognize that area as well. Some of the bigger records we've accomplished, especially over the last few weeks, if you've been paying attention, we were able to navigate autonomously, right? We basically tell the rover, we want you to go from point A to point B. But like I mentioned earlier, we don't have a joystick that's doing that kind of operation. Instead, we tell the rover, we want you to navigate to this other point over here because it's interesting to us. We want to take a closer look. And the rover actually autonomously takes images, drives and makes decisions to make sure that it's not driving over obstacles that are too large or maybe drive off a cliff. It'll prevent itself from doing something like that. One key aspect is that this rover is the fastest rover we've ever driven on Mars. Despite it only going about 0 0.01 miles per hour, it's the fastest rover we've flown autonomous, or we've drove, we've driven autonomously on another planet, which is how we've been able to cover so far up to 320 meters in a single day, which is a record on another planet. We've been taking plenty of images, and I invite all of you. All of these images that we've been taking with our rover, you guys can actually access online almost as immediately as we can on our operations uh, console. So make sure after this, there's some links that I will share. You can go online and see all of the images that the rover is taking as we navigate through the surface of Mars. And it's been plenty of pictures. It's been over 100,000 pictures at this point. So we have a lot, very high detailed images and videos because we've been able to record things such as our flights from the rover. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the key aspects has been to transform that carbon dioxide into oxygen. And that's been through this instrument, MOXIE, which is helping us study how to do that and what kind of technologies we need to scale in the future so that the astronauts, maybe some of you up here in the front, maybe once you're on the surface of Mars, you'll need something like this to be able to breathe while you're on the surface. If you guys went to our station, one of the key aspects of this mission as we're exploring the rocks and studying our environment is to core rocks, right? So you guys have used drills, or maybe you've seen your parents use drills on the wall and like make holes on rocks. We take it a step further. Not only do we make holes on the rocks, but we also core them and actually break the rocks and take samples, store them in little tubes, which we have some to demonstrate with us, that will eventually be picked up, dropped off somewhere, so that another rover picks it up and brings it back to Earth. Something we've never done is bring back samples from Mars, and that's a very difficult, very difficult thing to do. So we're obviously very excited to be planning that mission in upcoming years. Here are some examples of the cores that we have collected so far. And as you can see in the different images, they're very colorful, they're very different. They all have different kind of minerals, different kind of geometries, right? Which tell us the history of the planet and these different locations where we've been, we've been collecting the images as to how things form because some places had more water than others, water flowed in a certain way, different material, materials were gathered in different places. And the best way I can describe this to you, right? If you guys go to a river, how many of you have been to a river in your life? Right, you guys have been to a river. If you go to any river, you pick up a rock and you break it in half, right? And you just take a little hammer to it and break it in half and you see what the rock looks like inside of it. More than likely, it's a sedimentary rock that over time, layers of material have just been depositing that tell us the history of that river. Similarly, that's the kind of approach we're taking when we study these rocks as we look for them on the surface of Mars. And of course, we take pics or it didn't happen, right? Anytime you guys go somewhere, you take a selfie. Well, we've been able to take selfies with the rover as we've accomplished different features on the surface of Mars. Unlike what you guys do, where you maybe take your phone and just take a single image, 
The rover has to work a little bit harder because the camera that it has on its robotic arm takes smaller images. So instead what it does is it takes 30 something pictures and then we have to stitch them together and we get these awesome images that we now hang some of us in our offices and rooms and houses. Because how epic is it that we can take a selfie next to a Mars helicopter? The Mars helicopter, right? First time we've ever flown on another planet, something very difficult to do. But here's a small video of that first time that we successfully float on the surface of Mars. Actually, this is probably, I think, the fourth, the fourth time or so when it got a little bit more complicated. But originally, that mission was just to prove to ourselves, can we even fly on Mars? Is there enough air for us to be able to push off the ground and fly? Can our helicopter survive the cold Martian nights? And everything worked so well that now it's part of the mission as our own scout to help us study what's around us because maybe we can't get to the, those respective areas with the rover, so we have some eyes in the sky to help us do that. And maybe one day, right, when the astronauts go to Mars, they can also bring drones with them to help them study the surrounding areas to their respective base. So far, we've had 19 flights over the last year, and many of them have increased in complexity over time. So we keep pushing the boundaries of those flights because we're learning how to do it every time we accomplish a flight. And what I want you guys to keep in mind is that it takes about 26 hours of sunlight or so for that battery to charge because we want to keep some of that energy not only to fly, and some of our flights are maybe a minute, a minute and a half, maybe up to two minutes. Total flight time has been about 30, but we want to make sure that we have enough energy also to keep us warm at night because it is really, really cold and we don't want our batteries to freeze over. So we have to play this game in coordination. When do we want to fly? When do we have enough energy to communicate with the rover and send all those images? When do we just want to stay put and just warm up for the night so that we continue collecting energy? And that's the kind of operations we have to think about because also this helicopter flies completely on its own. Similar to the, heli to the rover, we tell it, hey, we want you to fly from point A to point B. The helicopter then does it completely autonomously. This is a really cool picture. And I was actually on console when we got this down for the first time. I was the very first person to see this image. This is a helicopter image that we took, one of the first colored images in one of those first flights. And as we notice, in the very corner over here, we actually took a picture of the rover, which was just a very epic moment once we realized that we were able to do that with our helicopter and the kind of coordination that we were working with at the time. So this was very exciting and this image is very, very special for me personally. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna be driving a lot because we have accomplished some of our objectives in the place we're currently at and we're gonna be driving towards a delta, which is one of the specific places where the, what we thought was a river flowed in liquid form, so we want to go see what kind of rocks do we see at the end of this flow. What can we find in this delta? So over the next few weeks, we'll be just driving, 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 and funny enough, we're calling it the Drive Drive campaign to get us to this new place so we can continue studying different samples and different rocks. This is a high-level picture, right? This is from one of our satellites of Jezero Crater. This is the area where we landed. This area was selected amongst many sites because if you look at it, right, it's obvious. There was water flow there. It's almost very clear that at some point there was liquid water, which is what I've been saying. So we started just in this little corner, and when we, we're going to be driving to this delta area, and eventually we're going to move on to different sites until we get to the very ridge of this crater. So we have exciting, still two years, uh, two Earth years left to go of exploration, so that we can continue finding more evidence that we may potentially find evidence of life. So over the last year and what's coming next, we're gonna keep on flying a rover. We're gonna keep doing more autonomous exploration, driving, taking images, taking videos. There's also sound, I don't think I've mentioned that, but we have some microphones on board as well. So you can actually go online and find the sounds of Mars and even find the sounds of the helicopter because we did record when we took off for that first time. It's, a very subtle buzz in the video, but you can hear it. 
Here are some of the websites. Uh, we have plenty of links uh, on our stations. So you guys can go and see these raw images. And what's really cool about this, many times, and we can see this online on different forums, just the average science, uh, the, the average citizen science that happens is that people see things that we may not necessarily see as we're looking at the images. So the public actually finds these really cool, interesting features that then maybe spark some scientific conversation as well. So I invite you guys to go take a look at these images. And we have, we're on social media everywhere, so please feel free to share your thoughts if you find something. You can follow along where Perseverance is, along with Ingenuity on the surface of Mars, so that you can keep up with the mission day to day as we do on console. There's sounds as well, like I mentioned, and they're really cool. And I've even seen people take some of these sounds and remix them into their own music. So that's been really fun to see online. Well, I'm going to leave it open to questions, but I did want to highlight we have plenty of social media pages online all over the place, including a lot of resources in Spanish. So feel free to join any of them and follow along and tag us and ask questions there. There's plenty of live events all the time. I just participated in one last Friday, but I'll leave it up to questions. And thank you guys for listening. All right, guys. So if anyone has any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'm going to come over to you with a microphone. All right. What's your question? Why is why is the uh, Mars red? Is it because of iron oxide? Great question. Why is Mars red? Yes, there's a lot of different kind of irons and a lot of different materials that have gathered there over time, and that's what gives it its red color. So you're absolutely correct. Great question. All right. Other a lot of it is. There's other materials as well. Good question. Right. So I've heard that perseverance and curiosity are similar. What is similar about them? Because they're related. Repeat that a little bit. Like um, I heard that curiosity and the perseverance rovers are are related so i'm curious how are they similar great question she's asking how is perseverance similar to curiosity the previous rover they are almost identical in size they have very similar architecture so a lot of the computers and a lot of the components that we use in curiosity we actually recycled a lot of those same designs to save us time to save us money and then we upgraded some of its capabilities, there's more autonomy, we've upgraded the instruments, so we have new instruments on Perseverance, but you're absolutely right in seeing them and realizing that they are very, very similar rovers, but that's because we did borrow a lot from Curiosity to apply it over to Perseverance. So great question. All right, we have another one over here. How do rocks maneuver, how does the rover maneuver around rocks? How does the rover maneuver around rocks? Ah, fantastic question. How does the rover maneuver around rocks? Well, as we're driving through the surface of Mars, like I mentioned earlier, the rover is taking its own decisions. And how does it do that? It's taking images as it drives. And as it takes images, it's running algorithms that detect objects around it. And based on some safety parameters that we had to test here on Earth, it knows not to go over rocks of certain sizes or holes of certain depths and make sure it doesn't drive off different cliffs, for example. So the rover is pretty smart, but that's because here on the ground, we've done a lot of tests in the Mars yard out in California and JPL in Pasadena, which is where I spend a lot of time actually conducting these tests so that before we get to Mars, we know how to do all of those fantastic autonomous capabilities. Good question. All right, next question right over here. How long will it take for the samples to arrive? I'm so sorry, repeat the question. How long will it take to the samples? For, how long will it take for the samples to arrive? How long will it take for the samples to arrive? Great question. All I will say for now, it's to be determined. The mission is being formulated and built. So keep up, keep up with us on social media because there will be more announcement over the upcoming years. But I think over the next 10 years or so, we're going to be hearing a lot about the Mars sample return mission. That's uh, maybe as soon as you're done with college, you'll be able to join right on board. All right, another question right here. Since it is so cold in Mars, why is the water not frozen? Why what? is the water not frozen in Mars if it's so cold? It is frozen. It is? It's very frozen. So Mars is very cold, and the water that we know that exists on Mars is either underground 
or very frozen. But yes, it's really cold. All right, any other questions? Oh, another one over here. Where is the a little helicopter dinghy? What is the store, the a Volvo dinghy? Wait, wh where is the helicopter? Yeah, well, where, where does the thing store it? Where, where do they store it? Where do we store the helicopter? Yeah. The helicopter is on its own. It's completely separated from the rover and it uses solar panels to actually charge, but it's completely separate. Before it's separated though, maybe this is what you're asking. We actually stored the helicopter underneath the rover. It was kind of in a little pouch that it took as it was on, it, on the rocket and through space. And over the first few days we were on Mars, we dropped that shell, we deployed the helicopter, and dropped it off and drove away so that then the helicopter could drive, could fly off. It's more, I like to say, it kind of gave birth to the, to the helicopter. <laughs> All Good right, question. our next question over here. Go ahead. How big is the helicopter? Great question. How big is the helicopter? I invite you to go upstairs because we have a model of it. It's right underneath the space shuttle. But just to, get, to give you an idea, it's about four pounds. And the, the rotors on it are about a meter, a little bit bigger than a meter. But it's a relatively compact system. So you can go upstairs, and we have a one-to-one scale, -one scale model of the, pic, of the helicopter. You can take plenty of pictures of it as well. That's right. Do not miss it, everyone. Go on upstairs to our space shuttle pavilion. We've got full-scale model of the Perseverance rover and of the Infinity helicopter. Okay. Thank you so much, Elio. My mask is Thank stuck on Thank you, guys. Head. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was absolutely awesome. amazing. So cool to Thanks hear about so what's much. going on up there. And thank you so much for all of that amazing work that you're doing on it, too. I know you told me earlier you have a really special connection with this place. I do. Because he grew up around here. He came to the Intrepid as a kid. And now here he is talking about his work, doing this, and having a model of his work right above his head. How cool is that? Another round of applause for Elio, everyone. Amazing. Thanks so much for being here. All right. So, everyone, we are off to an amazing start. But do not forget, we've got a number of other cool scientists and engineers here as well from NASA, from a whole bunch of different branches of NASA, actually. Check out their exhibits. Check out their activities. Also, miss our maker zone over here. We are making our own Mars rovers. Have you made one of those yet? Which I have not. Right over there. I need so, to join. You need to join. That's right. You of all people. Um, and everyone, coming up at 3 o'clock, we are going to be welcoming back another NASA scientist, actually, who is going to give us another really fascinating talk about Mars, too. So for those of you tuning in from home right now, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to come by the Intrepid as well. We've got a whole bunch of other exciting things going on all week long. Performances. We've got animals coming later on in the week. Robots. We've got sports things. All kinds of things, everyone, for the whole family. So be sure to come by. Check it out. And for everyone else, we'll see you back here at 3 o'clock. All right. Happy Kids Week, everyone. See you next time. Thank you.